So guys, we're here with Eloise today. Eloise Hello. is qualified vet. You're a large animal vet. I, I'm mixed practice vet. Mixed practice. So small yeah. and large animal. Yeah. And today you're going to take us through just some health checks that anyone could do yep. at home with their cattle. We yep. have, happen to have a big boy in the crush. And we'll have <laughs> a look and see how things go. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Yep. Thank you very much. Lead <laughs> no the way. <laughs> okay. Um, so first things first, we always want to think about safety. Safety is the number one thing. So we want to be familiar with the equipment that we're using. So talking about our crush. And we also want to have a bit of an idea of the cow and how she's going to behave when we're moving around her. So um, there's lots of different ways to do a physical exam on a cow. I was taught to do a five station exam. So that's where we start at the back end and then we do the left side and then the right side and then the head and then we come back to the back end again. I'll often walk behind them rather than in front uh, because anytime you pass in front of their head they get a bit nervous. Uh, depending on your setup and what sort of cow they are, you know, safety is always first. So if it's not safe to walk behind them, you'll walk in front of their head. But um, I try to avoid it if I can. A similar thing, while I'm doing my exam, if the farmer is standing with me, they often like to stand up near their head, but I'll tell them, oh, you know, come around and stand near me so that they're not near her head. Because when they're standing there and they're talking to me and moving their arms around, Poor old Daisy gets a bit stressed and, oh, what's that guy doing? And he's jumping around while I'm trying to examine him. So uh, we try not to stand near their head if we don't have to, and I tend to leave that the head closer to the end of the exam because otherwise it just stresses them out. That's why I also do things like take my heart rate and my respiratory rate before I go to her head because once I've fiddled with her head, her heart rate and her respiratory rate are going to be higher than what they truly are because she's a bit stressed out. Uh, we have to be quite careful around the head because it's a great spot for getting your hands stuck between the crush and the cow, particularly sort of behind her ears there. So we're always very, very cautious uh, when we're looking at the head. And hey, while we've got your attention with the cute baby animal and all, would you mind pressing that little red button down there to subscribe? It'll really help out the channel and keep the videos coming. Thanks, guys. So um, step one of our exam, we start at the back end. So we, um, well, first of all, the farmer would bring the cow up and put her in the crush. Um, I like them to be in a head bale, which is the doors that shut behind her ears there. It keeps her in the crush there and she can't come back and get me. So if I stand in behind her, I know that she can't come back and crush me against the door. So always thinking about safety. Uh, so the first part, station one, we're gonna stand behind the cow. We'll often let her know that we're there, we'll talk, we'll touch her on the bum. Um, it's often safer to stand in close, just how we were learning before, because if she happens to kick out, she's just going to shove us. But if we're standing all the way back here, then she can kick me and get her right at the forceful end of her kick. So that um, hoof's going to hit me right in the leg. So as scary as it is, it's safer to be in nice and close to her. So first part of our exam, Station number one, we're just going to have a look at the physical condition of the cow. So for a beef cow with um, body condition scoring, we score them from zero being the skinniest cow you can imagine to five being the fattest cow you can imagine. We want them to sit around about two and a half or three. Skinny is no good because um, you know, it can indicate different diseases. Um, it means their nutrition is often poor so they're not getting enough calories in. But too fat is also bad because it means we have problems with things like carving. Uh, it can lead to a whole lot of metabolic diseases, so that's where our metabolism is not working properly. So we want them to sit between two and a half and three if we can. Um, so yeah, we'll have a look at the condition of the cow. So we're looking at things like how much fat is over her hips, uh, how wide is she. Uh, we can also have a bit of a look at her ribs, but we'll look at that more when we, um, we go to... Uh, the sides of the cow as well. Um, at this point we'll often also try to get her to wee so that we can do a dipstick exam on her. So a dipstick tests things like blood in the urine, the pH of the urine, protein in the urine. What we do is we rub the skin that sits just beneath the vulva, so it's called the escutcheon. It's just there. So just with a couple of fingers you're just going to rub up and down. Okay, she wee. So they don't always wee. But there Not you there go, and then you want to put your dipstick in the wee as well. But you try to get a nice clean sample, so keep rubbing. So use your left hand to rub oh. her. There you go, so you want all the wee to fall on those different coloured squares. 
So just having a bit of a wait for us there. So then you can sit there and look at your dipstick, which will tell you things like uh, if there's any glucose in the wee, which can indicate diabetes. So we can see that's a negative because it's nice and blue and it's not brown. Uh, bilirubin, which can indicate liver disease. Again, we don't have any of that. Ketones, which can indicate metabolic problems. So no ketones. If we had ketones, it would be dark purple there. Um, blood, no blood. The pH of the urine. So her pH is a little bit low compared to most cows. Normally their pH is between 7 and 9, but if she's being fed a substantial amount of grain, then we'll expect that pH to lower a bit. Um, there's maybe a trace amount of protein in that wee, but you know there was a bit of, um, it wasn't a, a nice steady stream of wee, it sort of dribbled down a bit, so that could just be a bit of poo contamination. And urobilinogen, which can indicate urinary and liver issues as well. Um, it's not really a very accurate reading there, it's probably had a bit of poo on it. So it can just tell us a whole lot of things about um, metabolic disease and um, urinary issues. Um, most of what happens at the back end we do at the very end. Would anybody know why that is? So when we talk about our five station exam, first station is really just having a general overview of the cow, taking some wee before she wees while we're doing our exam. Uh, we'll also have a look at the skin over her. So if you're looking for things like whether or not she's been mated by the bull, sometimes you'll see heat detectors on the top of their tail there. So they might be um, uh, white and then they go red when the bull jumps on them, puts pressure on the heat detector. So you'll look at things like that. Um, just the general condition of her coat as well. Uh, but yeah, we don't do things like taking temperature or doing a rectal or fiddling with her udders because it makes them a bit, um, nervous and a bit flighty so we leave that to the end because we've got to get through the rest of it first so step one's pretty basic really. So left side of the cow, can anybody tell me what we might look at on the left side of the cow? Mm -hmm. Yeah, bloat, so why would we see bloat? What's on the left side of the cow? Um, the rumen. Rumen. Yep, rumen, good job. So the rumen is? Yeah, so it's part of the stomach. How many stomachs do cows have? Four. 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 Yeah, well done. So can anybody name any of the other stomach compartments as well? Pardon? Yeah, amazing. Well done. So we've got reticulum, that's the first part of the stomach, then rumen, then amazing, then abamazin. So four stomachs. So we can look at the rumen on this side because the rumen sits more to the left. So when we're concerned about bloat, we tend to look around this area here where the rumen will sit. We'll get gas up the top and fluid down the bottom there. So we'll definitely have a look at the rumen. What else do we look at? Um, heart rate. Yep, heart. Absolutely. Where do you think I would listen for the heart? Towards the... Yeah, so it sits right under their elbow. So what we do is we pop our stethoscope up underneath their elbow there. Uh, things to be aware of on the left side, putting your hands between the cow and the crush because they can move around and they can move and squash your hand between the crush and herself. So we're always conscious of where we're putting our hands. Uh, we also have to be careful of being kicked. Luckily this crush has got solid doors down the bottom there. Sometimes you'll get crushes that have um, just rails, sort of like, like the ropes there, and they can kick through. So we're always conscious of that as well. So yep, we can listen to her heart. What else are we going to listen to? Can we do the rest of the time? Yep, lungs. lungs. Yep, absolutely. So they're the main things that we're going to listen to on the left side there. So with our heart, we're going to pop our stethoscope in our ears. We let her know that we're there. You always keep a bit of your body on them so that you can feel when they're going to move. So I'll often keep my arm in contact with them so that way I can feel if they're going to shift. The other thing you can do is push them over a bit as well or get somebody to grab their tail stand on that side of the crush and pull them over that side for you if you're really worried. So we let her know that we're here. Hi cow. We're going to slip the head of our stethoscope up underneath her elbow there. We're going to listen. So we'll listen for 30 seconds to take our heart rate. So say if our heart rate is 30 beats in 30 seconds, multiply it by two and we get a, a heart rate of 60 beats per minute. 
Does anybody know what a cow's heart rate should be? 60 to 80 is generally normal for a cow. We'll also listen to the heart sounds as well. So it should sound like lubbed up. Sometimes we'll get some extra heart sounds in there or skipped beats. So that can tell us that she might have a heart condition. So we'll have a listen to her heart and we'll have a listen to her lungs. So our lung fields are going to extend around this area. So over the ribs there. So we'll have a good listen in multiple spots. You can also listen from the top to the bottom in a line. So you listen here, 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 here. Sometimes you'll hear changes in the lung sounds and that can indicate things like fluid around the lungs. Um, then when we're listening to the rumen, we're going to listen around this area here. We're going to listen for nice gurgly noises. We can also blot her, which is where we put our stethoscope on and at the same time we actually do some fist pumping and that gets all the fluid jiggling around in her rumen. So it's listening for things like excess gas buildup. Um, we can do percussion, which is where we flick her side at the same time. So if we're listening for things like displacement of her um, other stomach compartments, like um, displacement of the abomasum, so we call that an LDA, left displaced abomasum, should sit down the bottom, but sometimes if it fills with gas, it can creep up the side. So if we make flicking with our fingers and we listen at the same time, sounds like a tin can, so bing, 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 when you're listening to it. So that can tell you that, oh, there's a big gassy stomach compartment sitting up here and it should be down there. So we'll have a listen to her rumen as well. Um, all right, any volunteers? Mm. Things that we'd be looking for? The chemical? Yeah, so the chemical balance of the rumen. So the pH. Yeah, perfect. So pH might indicate what were we talked about before with the grain. Uh, like how well she digests. Yeah, so you can tell us a bit about a colour. specific colour that it needs to be? Mm, the colour can vary a bit depending on what they're eating. Mm. But what were we talking about with the grain that we were feeding before? What was that condition called? Oh, the, the, the pH that? would be lower. Yep, exactly. So the pH would be more acidic. So we would be looking for acidosis. So that's when they're eating too much grain too quickly, they get sick. The other thing we'll often look at is the bugs in the rumen fluid as well because the rumen's basically just a big vat that fermentation occurs in. So that's where all the grass and the grain goes and it sits there and gets jumbled around, tossed around with all the microbes and it gets broken down. So that's where the majority of our digestion gets done. So we want to see a nice healthy population of microbes when we look under the microscope at that fluid. Uh, so what we do is we pop our stethoscope in this area here. This is called the paralumbar fossa. So it's a bit of a hole in her side, a bit of a sunken hole there. Uh, so we'll have a listen there. We'll also have a listen down lower. Uh, so we're listening for contractions. It sounds like a bit like um, an upstairs toilet flushing, a bit of a gurgly noise. Uh, we might also do some allotment. So that's where we were pushing our fist into her side and getting it to jiggle like that, so listening for that fluid movement. Um, the rumen should contract once a minute. So the other thing you can do is just stand there and watch. And once a minute, you should notice that this area here is sunken in, but it'll push out and then it'll go back in again. So that's normal because the rumen's mixing everything around. So once a minute, we get a big ruminal contraction there. Who wants to listen to the rumen? The right side is quite similar to the left side. We're going to be checking the same things again. So we'll listen to her heart again, her lungs again. Um, with the heart, you can listen in various positions to listen to the valves. So there's three valves that you can hear on the left side. There's one valve that you can hear on the right side. You've just got to practice at positioning your stethoscope in particular areas to listen for the different heart valves. Um, we'll also have another listen to her chest on this side. Um, we also listen to gut sounds on the right side. Do we know what sits on the right side? Any guesses? Yeah. Would it be her intestines? Correct. Well done. No, your anatomy. <laughs> so we'll have a listen to your intestines on the right side. We don't tend to hear as many um, gut sounds or as, um, what's the word? I guess they're not as consistent, not as reliable. We um, pay much more attention to the gut sounds on the left side, but it's still important to listen on the right side, um, especially because you can have displacement of those stomachs again. So just like we have a left displaced abomasum, so that's where that one stomach compartment can creep up the left side. We can get the same on the right side. We can get a right displaced stabamazin. So that stomach compartment can creep up the right side of the cow. So we'll have a listen around this region. 
We'll do our pinging again, we we'll click her side and you might hear that tin can bing, bing, bing sound and that will tell you that that other mason's maybe crept up that side where it shouldn't be. Um, it's also a good opportunity to look at body condition as well. So we have a look at how much coverage she has over her ribs, whether she's very skinny uh, and just, you know, a good look at all of her side there, really looking for any wounds, cuts, that sort of thing. So what things are we going to look at with the head? Eyes. Yep, eyes. What are we looking at with eyes? Yep. So what are we looking for with things that might be wrong? Gunk. Yep, you can just call them out. Weeping. Yep. Maybe if their eyes are a bit more like dry or watery. Yep, exactly. Yep. What about the whites of our eyes? What colour should they be? White. 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 We want whites. White. Whites of our eyes. Um, so sometimes they might be yellow. So it's jaundice, which is liver disease. Um, sometimes they can go a muddy brown colour, which can happen with various plant toxins. Um, if they've got eye disease, so things like pink eye, which is a bacterial infection, they might go a bit red. Um, we're definitely looking for weepiness. Symmetry is a good thing as well, so they should both be the same, same size, eyelids should look the same. Um, yeah, one shouldn't be swollen, one shouldn't be sunken in. So symmetry is a big thing as well. So eyes. Have a bit of a look at their ears. We don't often do much with ears. Yeah. Maybe look at their teeth or their mouth. Yeah, mouth. Mouth's a big one as well. So we'll look at things like their nose. Generally, most cows have a nice wet nose. Um, you can look at things like nasal discharge if you've got a respiratory infection. Uh, so we want to look at things like the consistency, the colour, is it smelly? Uh, we definitely have a look at their teeth. Who knows about cow mouths? So they've got teeth top and bottom? No, what have they got at the top? They've got like... Gum. Um, so we've got dental pads, yeah, plates, that sort of thing. So no teeth at the top, we've got incisors at the bottom, and we've got molars at the back. There's a gap between the teeth at the front and the teeth at the back. So we're going to use that to our advantage because we need to try to open her mouth. You can imagine that's a great way to get your fingers chomped. So I'll show you how to open a cow's mouth if she cooperates as well. Uh, you can also look at lymph nodes, so we've got submandibular lymph nodes under here. Uh, when we're feeling those, we have to be careful not to get our hands stuck. Uh, it's also a good way to look at uh, how alert and bright she is. Is she feisty and um, sprightly as she normally is, or is she dull and depressed and doesn't really care what we're doing? Uh, they're the main things that we're looking at. So we can see her eyes, they're nice and symmetrical. She doesn't have any discharge. We can lift up her upper lid to have a look at the whites of her eyes. <laughs> Having a good old sniff. Uh, there is a trick you can do where you can actually partly prolapse their eyes. So you push their eyelids in and it makes their eye pop out a bit further. So it's useful when you're looking for eye cancers. Now we might have a go at um, taking her tongue out and having a look in her mouth. Do you mind if I can do that? Oh no, go for it. might be a bit of fun because I'm sure. So when we're looking in the mouth, we want to stand with our body beside her and our back to the head bale, which is this thing here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, they're always going to wiggle around with this, so it's always a bit of fun and we've got to be pretty careful. But we get in nice and close to her so that she can't smack her out of the way with her head. The worst she can do is shove. We're going to pop our hand in her mouth, but we're going to put it in that gap where there's no teeth. So we don't put it at the front and we don't put it too far back. You just slide it in the side into that gap there. And then you press up. And when you press up, that oh, going to open her mouth. So she's going to open her mouth. And then we're going to pop our hand in and pull her tongue out the side of her mouth. So when we're putting our hand in her mouth, we have to be really careful to stay right in the middle of her mouth. We don't want to go to the side of her mouth because that's where she can get our fingers with her molar teeth. So we'll give it a go. Hopefully she'll cooperate. So put my hand in the gap there. You can see she's got, wait, chew me. I don't know if you guys can see, but she's got incisors at the front, at the, at the bottom, and a dental pad at the top. So we'll have a go at pulling her tongue out. That one. So we've got her tongue there, jiggle around like that. If they're really, really hating it, we can sedate them, but often you don't have to. They'll rush around for a while, 
you just hang on and they tend to stay still again. So you put your hand in the side and use your other hand to grab their tongue, pull it out the side. Then the worst they can do is yeah, right, chew on their own tongue so they're not chewing on your fingers. If you can do that, then have a good look in her mouth as well. Um, the other trick that's good is once you've got her tongue out and you've pulled it out to the side, you can actually then put your hand all the way in there and have a really good feel around as well. We won't do that with her so you won't freak her out too much. She's doing pretty well. So you might be looking for cancerous lumps and things like that yep, so when you're doing like that mouth exam. Lumpy Ulcers. Jaws, woody tongue, so lots of different bacterial infections like infection of the tongue, um, infection at the back of the throat there. So things like calf diphtheria or necrotic stomatitis, which are two bacterial infections we see right at the back of the mouth. Um, often smelling their breath can give you an indication as to whether or not there's something going on in the mouth as well. Um, and yeah, just having a, a general overview look at like teeth, colour of the gums as well is a good one for knowing whether they're anemic. So that's where their blood, uh, red blood cell count is too low. Um, teeth, tongue, colour of the gums, back of the throat, uh, dental pads, just having good look in there. Uh, sometimes you'll get things stuck as well because they love eating silly things like apples and turnips and that sort of thing. So you have a good look in there and make sure there's nothing stuck. So yeah, that's generally the head. So yeah, that's station four. Often with station four, so the head, if there's nothing wrong, like if I get called out for a sore leg, I often won't look at their head because I know that it's just going to freak them out. But if you're doing a really, really thorough exam on a cow that's maybe losing weight just a bit unwell but we don't really know why, then you should definitely include your head in your physical exam. Things like tooth infections, something stuck down there that could explain why she's maybe not eating as well, so she's losing weight. Yeah. All right, we'll go to our final station, which is station five, which is back to the bum. All right, back to... Back to the bottom again, so this is station five, so the final part of our exam. And this is where most of the stuff happens with the back end. That first um, station of the exam, really we were just looking at things like the condition of the cow. Um, we're also look, uh, grabbing urine before she wees, because often they'll wee when you're fiddling around with them. So again, we want to let her know that we're there, so we touch her. We say, hi cow, I'm here. We get in nice and close to her so that if she kicks, she can really only give us a bit of a shove she can't send us flying so you can do lots of different things back here you can take a pulse rate by feeling the pulse underneath her tail there she's got an artery that runs underneath her tail so just with your fingers you can keep your fingers there and you can feel that pulse we can also collect blood from her tail vein which runs on the underside of her tail um, we can take her temperature as well so we'll take her temperature in her bottom there uh, we can get an idea um, as to her hydration status and also her um, uh, the, the colour of mucous membranes. So it's similar to when you're looking at gum colour in their mouth, you can look at the colour of their vulva. So we just part the vulval lips. We see that they're nice and pink there. So it should be nice and pink, not white, not yellow. Um, so that's a, a nice easy way that you can assess their red blood cell count without having to look in their gums. It's much less stressful for her. Um, we can look at different things, like if there's any growths in the vulva there. Uh, we'll also have a look at her udder. So if she's a dairy cow, it's a, a big thing to check. Uh, it's often something that they don't like, so we have to be quite careful when we slip our hand down there to have a feel. So you want to have a good feel of their teats. Sometimes it's easier to get to the front teats from the side. So we'll have a good feel, make sure that they're not hot or swollen if she's a milking cow. It can also give you an idea in a beef cow as to when they're going to carve. When they get close to calving time, they'll bag up, which means that their udder fills up with milk. Uh, so we'll check all those as well. Um, all right. Uh, we can also do a rectal exam, which is a big part of our exam. So it's an internal exam. We put on a nice long glove and we pop our hand into her bottom. We have a good feel around. We can feel things like the rumen. Um, if we've got displacement of those other stomach compartments, like the abomasum, we can feel for a fetus or a baby. Uh, we can feel her kidneys, lots of different things. Uh, so we might start with taking a temperature. Do we have any volunteers for taking a temp? Yeah. Well, <laughs> so I'm always nice to my cows. I always use a bit of lube. So I think that's the nice way to go. So when you're taking a cow's temperature, it's not like a dog or a cat where you can just pop it in and you don't have to go very far. 
we have to put this bad boy pretty much all the way up, all the way up her bottom. And you want to try to get the tip of the thermometer to touch the side of her rectum. If we shove it straight in, it could potentially sit into a fecal ball and we'll get a falsely low temperature. So if that's her rectum, when we go in, we want to go in and tilt it off to the side slightly so that we're actually touching it against the rectal wall. That gives us a much more accurate temperature reading. So are you ready to do the honours? So you want to pop that thermometer in and we want to go in, so it should go in relatively easily. And we want to go even further. You're going to have to hold on to the end of it pretty tightly and then tilt it off to the side a little bit. You want to get in. Sometimes while you're doing it, you'll be able to feel her moving. It gives you a bit of a gauge as to, um, you know, where she's going to go. Um, I find it much harder if you're not touching her at all. We sort of don't know what she's going to do, but you can feel her shift her weight. So we'll often keep a bit of a hand on her, even hold her tail, and then you just pop your thermometer in. So we've got a good temperature reading there. What temperature would you be starting to concern, be concerned about, Eloise? Oh, 39 and a half? 39 and a half, I'd start yeah. to get a bit like, hmm. Okay, yeah, but even still, if she's stressed, that could be enough to put her temperature up. So, yeah, it depends on the circumstance, really. But technically, anything over 39 and a half is high. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's not much else to do with her here because she's not sort of got much going on. I mean, you know, if, if you're worried about things like a urinary problem, so say if the farmer had called you out because he'd noticed that the cow was straining to wee, then you'd probably have a good look at her vulva there separate the vulval lips and have a good, she's not going to like this, have a good look at where the urethra comes out which is where the wee comes out so there'll be a little hole up there. You can actually pass a catheter up there as well to collect urine too. Um, as I said if it was a dairy cow you'd have a really good look at her udders, have a good feel of all four of them making sure they're not hot or swollen. Um, but yeah we might do a rectal exam on her now so with our rectal exam what we're going to do is Stand nice and close um, with a rectal, rectal glove on. We're going to pop some lube on our glove and then we pop our hand into her bottom and we go nice and slow because she'll have what we call waves of peristalsis. So it's like um, waves of the muscle of the colon sort of um, wiggling along. So you put your hand in slowly and sort of let that come up over your arm. We don't sort of go in and be forceful. If you feel tension there or um, resistance then you just stop and let it sort of relax and come over your hand. So I might show you how I do a rectal. We want to tip some lube. See, you want a good dollop in your palm and then a little bit going up your, up your arm there as well. So luckily she's had a nice poo to empty out. Get rid of that. So what we're going to do is we get nice and close, we sort of hold her tail out the way for a second, make a little torpedo with your fingers. So if you want to move around this way so as you can see. And then in we go and we're not going to be too forceful. So if we feel resistance then we stop and you go all the way in and then we actually scoop back a little bit and that brings some of the rectum back so it's not tight. So what can we feel? I can feel the head of the calf sitting right beneath my hands, so yeah, sitting about yeah. there. If we feel up and to the left, we can feel a kidney. If we feel down a little bit, we can feel some of the rumen, but that calf's head's getting in the way. Off to the right, we can feel another kidney. This calf's quite big, so it's in the way. <laughs> much else to feel really with that calf sitting right there. So thanks very much Eloise, no it's absolutely <laughs> awesome to have your knowledge and expertise out here today. Um, the big take home message of course is obviously don't do a rectal exam unless you're properly trained. <laughs> yes, correct. <laughs> um, always start at the back end. Yes, yep, I do. Um, and don't do, a, don't do a head exam unless it's absolutely necessary. I think so, yes, mm. yeah, just stresses them out. I mean certainly if you think it's warranted, like if there's anything that could be going on in the head that's affecting you know why she may be unwell then absolutely go for it. Yep. But um, yeah, tend to leave it closer towards the end so you don't stress her out. And okay. um, make it quick if you can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, quick and painless yeah. is the way to go. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah. No, well, thank you very much. That's certainly no helping everyone with their livestock look for common signs and symptoms of a problem. And yeah. of course, call an amazing vet like Eloise mm. if you see any problems. Thank you, guys. No, 